everybody, welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Zach. And I'm Seth. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. We are That's the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. Wow, it's great to hear your voice again, Zach. I, uh, as you know, traveled to the uh, the great pit of Arkoon and uh, recovered... <laughs> the Sarlacc! Um, <laughs> re- recovered the puzzle episode. So now that it's back in the aether and everyone can have it on their ears, because that's what people were missing, the puzzle episode. Every day when I'm, when I'm walking to the studio from, I don't know, the room that I sleep in in this building... People yeah, are sure. always shouting at me from the streets. They're saying, where are puzzles? Where are they? And I say, I don't know what you mean, but they haven't done it since. So I think that's what they were looking for. Maybe. We we squatted a nice part of town. I don't know why people are screaming at you. <laughs> I don't know either, but they're asking, where are the puzzles? Man, the Curious George building used to be here. I don't know if it still is. No. <laughs> I, I always question <laughs> that that business. You don't think a business that runs on a uh, children's book that hasn't been popular in like 300 years <laughs> is going to do One of well? the most expensive parts in downtown Cambridge. It's like the you nicest. You see those kids lining up down the street for some Curious George. I just always felt like it was just wild. Anyway. Curious George um, dropping into Fortnite soon. <laughs> man, they should add the man with the yellow hat to Fortnite. That'd be hilarious. Yeah. Um, or, um, King Babar. The man with the yellow hat is like a poacher, right? Like, that's, that's just stick. Like, he dresses like a poacher, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then he finds love. He's like Ross. He just has an illegal monkey that just hangs out with him for no reason. Anyway, um, uh, I'm glad you're feeling better. And Thanks. not getting germs all over me. Producer Doug said that I did a great job holding the fort. And in fact, quote said, why do we pay for two brothers? <laughs> I informed him we neither of us have collected the salary in a couple of years. Uh, anyway, uh, Zach, uh, so while you were sick, I assume you played a lot of video games. So what have you been recently been playing? Recently, Seth, I've been playing Warcraft Chronicles of the Second War, Tides of Darkness. I talked about this before. I actually played a demo of it a while ago. I don't remember when, but I remember playing a demo and talking about it. And uh, Warcraft Chronicles of the Second War, Tides of Darkness, is a mod. It's a mod of Warcraft. Warcraft 3 Reforged that recently just came out. Warcraft 3 Reforged is a remaster of Warcraft 3 that's been out since 2020. It's a kind of contentious remaster of Warcraft 3. Uh, A lot of people weren't very impressed by it when it came out, but the team who created Chronicles of the Second War decided that they were going to utilize some of the changes and updates to Reforged to work on this mod. Now, this mod is a custom campaign based on the orc storyline of Warcraft 2 Tides of Dark. And I'm not just talking about like they took some maps from Warcraft 2, redid them in the Warcraft 3 map editor and dropped them in. No, no, no. This is a full-fledged campaign. It adds heroes, specifically Rent, Blackhand, Main Blackhand, Ogrim, Doomhammer, Gul'dan, Shulgal, Zuled, and Zul'jin, as well as various subheroes such as Captain Utok Scratcher, who is my favorite captain because he plays the role of, you know, when you start a campaign in Warcraft 2, some voice just starts barking like the orders and he's like, uh, Doomhammer commands us to collect a uh, hundred wood and build four oh. pig houses. Yeah, or like the beginning in Warcraft 1. Yeah, but it's also in Warcraft 2. That That's Utok's job. <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's good. just standing there at the beginning of missions, and sometimes he just tells you what to do. <laughs> All of the new heroes have their own voices that have been fully voice acted. There's brand new cinematics. There are expanded missions based on the content related to the lore of the Second War. There is like RPG elements added in, so they took this whole mission from Warcraft 2 that was just a you know generic map where you had to go fight some bad guys and do some combat and they turned it into a RPG segment where you're going through the tomb of Sargeras looking for Gul'dan to hunt him down and defeat him. They did a lot of really cool things with this mod and I highly recommend checking it out if you have Warcraft 3 Reforged and if you're a fan of Warcraft 3 or uh, are a fan of Warcraft 2 and a fan of the lore. Uh, It's very neat. Uh, They also added some naval combat which is always good and of course oil is now a 
resource because it was a resource in Warcraft 2, so they implemented the oil resource. A couple things I had minor complaints about. There were some glitches in the first release of this uh, full version of the mod. Uh, one of those glitches would sometimes make Rend Blackhand disappear from the game's cache, so he was supposed to appear in certain levels, and he does not. Uh, his voice lines are all still there. So sometimes oh, Ren good. Blackhand will be talking and he will not be on the screen. And maybe it was kind of funny. A, like a, maybe he's hiding behind a bush. Yeah, maybe. There's also was another glitch where you're supposed to be in a combat with Cho'Gal and he would walk off the map and disappear. <laughs> and never come back. Uh, these glitches have been fixed, but they were very funny glitches to, to experience when I got that far in the game before the, the fix was available. So the full campaign right now is out. It goes from the very first mission to the very last mission of the orc campaign there are three or four they're called boss missions they are side quests that you can take on if you are interested they are not required and from there uh, they are planning to recreate the human campaign for their next release i don't know how far along they are with the human campaign it's a small team developing this mod but i'm very excited about it and i hope to pick it up when it's available Nice, nice. That sounds like fun. It just makes me want to play the original Warcraft too. Yeah. And then when I want it, when I want to play the original Warcraft too, then it just makes me want to play the original Warcraft. And then I open it and then realize this game is really dated. All right, Seth. Uh, what have you been recently playing? Recently, I've been playing Bolt Gun, brought to you by Warhammer 40K, developed by Arak Digital and published by Focus Entertainment, and released back in May of 2023. You you play as a space marine. You and you wield a bolt gun and you have to fight heretical elements to the empire uh or well specifically the emperor so in the game uh you are playing as a member of the chapter of ultramarines which are the blue space marines in case anyone well the dark blue space marines if you were in case you were wondering who they were because there are multiple blue space marines the dark blue ones with the omega symbol they are the ultramarines and they're like the goody two-shoes of the uh, space marines which isn't saying much because you think even goody two shoots of space marines are still pretty messed up yeah no they're actually not the nice ones they're like the by the book ones the nice ones are actually the salamanders who are the green space marines they're friendly they also like flamethrowers <laughs> but the ultramarines like bolt guns and bolts so you play as an ultramarine and this particular ultramarine they have like a fun cinematic in the beginning it is warhammer 40k so sometimes there's a lot of complicated words that people use and i don't really understand what's going on but the, the gist of it is that you're essentially on your own and the person who's in charge of this mission really doesn't is also kind of detached from the rest of the empire and they are like we we still need to carry out our mission to, in order to like reconnect back to the the empire so you have to go to this planet and you have to like get to this main battery shoot a bunch of guns off and clear out like the heresy that's happening so you get a detachment of space marines and in true warhammer fashion because warhammer is grimdark the shuttle that you're riding on with your chapter brothers uh crashes and they all die except you so then you have to do and you and your you have a, a floating uh servitor skull he like floats around and, and tells you um like stuff that's going on and things about the map uh you're to go around and kill all the heretics so far uh i've played it through three levels and they each play for about 10 minutes which is nice it's actually something where i'm i've been playing like i'll be like man i'll play a level and then i'll i'll go play a different game I'll play it for like 10 minutes though and, and just kind of enjoy it. I like it a lot. It's a, it's classified as a boomer shooter and it's definitely got that frenetic action. What I really like is you have a chain sword and you have a bolt gun and whenever you use your chain sword, everything slows down so that you can chain sword people. It's very cool. It's a very good addition. And then you can get power ups for your bolt gun. You can get other weapons though. So far I'm like three levels in and still haven't found any other weapon. I don't know if that's because I'm an idiot. Or if they just really want you to love bolt guns. But there are like six other weapons. Well, five other weapons, I think. And I know a shotgun and a plasma gun are two other weapons. I just don't know if I haven't picked them up. But to be fair, the bolt gun is like on a pedestal. And they're like, oh, the holy bolt gun. And then you pick it up. And so I just assume every other weapon is going to be presented that way. So far, I haven't found any other weapons. Uh, I do have some grenades. And you also have the ability to run. And it's, it's fun. It's got platform elements. It's uh, very fast paced. And the gun and the combat is just very visceral very it's just it just feels good it's also stylized like a 90s retro shooter so 
it's kind of like if you took Dark Forces and set it all in Warhammer. It's like if Warhammer got a Dark Forces game, this is what that game would have been. It's very good. If you like the Warhammer universe or if you like boomer shooters or if you like both, I definitely recommend picking up Warhammer Bolt Gun, Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun. It's a uh, very, it's very fun. I just like it. And it's all about, you know, for the Emperor and all that jazz. And it's a fun, fun way to uh, spend some time just blasting through great soundtrack great blowing people up it's great nice well today we're talking about not so much of a violent thing as warcraft or blowing people up in bolt gun uh we're talking about uh, a game that seth referenced in the last episode um seth was convinced that this game was created by apogee and uh he was so convinced that i had to issue a correction in the middle of the episode while sick that's right seth was talking about chips challenge at one point as a puzzle game and referenced the fact that he th- had thought we had talked about chips challenge but we actually haven't so today we're going to talk about chips challenge and we're also going to talk about epics the company that created chips challenge and a little bit about the links the uh, system that chips challenge was effectively made for at some point in time we did cut in the bummer sound from chips challenge yeah i'm pretty sure that might have been in our like one of our first episodes when we talked about gaming memories really i think it was a pretty early episode if i can remember correctly i don't know i feel like it's later or it was when i was playing chips challenge one or chips challenge two and i referenced bummer and i'll put in bummer somewhere around here bummer seth do you have any memories of of chips challenge i do have memories i think i mentioned at some point in time in the episode that i masterfully did about puzzles about how chips challenge would go on to be standard on windows entertainment packs well it was standard when i was in school i'm pretty specifically high school was when uh windows entertainment had chips challenge as standard so uh when i should have been computer aiding designing i was instead playing chips challenge nice ultimately perhaps if i paid more attention in my cad classes maybe i would have become an engineer instead i have a podcast that doesn't pay me any money i definitely remember playing chips challenge i think also on a school computer but i mostly remember playing it at a family friend's house their computer had chips challenge on it our computer did not because we had the version of microsoft windows entertainment pack that was made specifically for our packard bell and chips challenge came out on the fourth uh version of the microsoft entertainment pack which uh we did not have growing up but one of my friends did so i got a chance to play it at their house i remember really liking it i also really liked the music the music is still very nostalgic for me i didn't realize at the time and i didn't realize actually until i was a bit older that the version i had been playing is considered kind of by many to be arguably the more inferior version of chips challenge as the original Lynx version has better graphics more music and a whole bunch of different things that are different about it and we'll get into that um so i think it was interesting when i did finally learn about the Lynx version which was thanks to seth Seth had a collection of emulators on a CD-ROM. One of those was an Atari Lynx emulator, and I loaded up Chips Challenge on there, and I was like, this is not the Chips Challenge I remember. And it was a different game. Also, there used to be a website called Home of the Underdogs, and on Home of the Underdogs, I was looking for Chips Challenge to play, and I found the DOS version of Chips Challenge, which is based on the Lynx version, not the windows version the windows version and the dos version are two very very different games and i also was very confused by this version of chips challenge that i was unfamiliar with because i had only played the windows version so those are just some of my experiences with chips challenge i honestly don't remember loading an atari Lynx emulator onto a cd-rom but it sounds like something i would do and to be fair i also don't remember sending an email that my boss referenced last week so I guess, you know, as my memory is running on top, I just I just assume I do the right thing in the moment. There was something I did want to say about old Chips Challenge. Oh, there was like 1 million levels. There's 149 levels in the PC version. Yeah, that's daunting because they get more challenging as they go along. More Chips Challenging? They get more Chips Challenging. Um, I feel like it would be funny if they were arbitrary in regards to the challenge level. And it was just like an RNG of which one level you started with first so then sometimes the level is really hard and sometimes the level is really easy when you start i guess in hindsight that would be frustrating now getting into the history of chips challenge to talk about chips challenge we have to of course talk about epics we have not talked about epics before and you know what it's a perfect time to go into the history 
of this rather interesting company. Epics not only developed video games, but they also developed hardware and assorted peripherals. Um, some people might be familiar with Epics because they released what was called the fast loader cartridge for the Commodore 64, which was used for fast loading games from disc. But they, they have a very interesting history that kind of goes all over the place. So let's get into it. Epics got their start around 1977 when John Freeman, a writer for Games Magazine, was invited to play Dungeons and Dragons by Susan Lee Marrow with Jeff Johnson and Jim Connolly. Jim, who acted as the game's dungeon master, decided to buy a Commodore pet as he felt it would help with the general bookkeeping of his Dungeons and Dragons game. Now, after he bought the Commodore pet, he also got the idea to come up with some games that could be developed and sold, partially so he could write the purchase of the Commodore Pet off as a business expense on his taxes that year. I want to live in the 70s where I could just be like, man, I need a thing to do Excel, and then I'm going to make stuff on the Excel machine to write off as taxes. If I could pay for my Excel machine. To cover my game of Dungeons and Dragons. To cover the Dungeons and Dragons admin. <laughs> yeah. I need to be able to log the weights of these here. Uh, your coins. <laughs> Jim and John got uh, to work on developing uh, some games for the pet. John came up with the rule set, background stories, manual, and missions, and Jim did the code. The game that they would go on to publish would be Starfleet Orion, published under the name of Automated Simulations. Starfleet Orion, released in 1978 for the Commodore Pet, and the game was also ported over to the TRS-80 and the Apple II. Starfleet Orion would retail for 1995 and 1978, which doesn't sound like a lot in today's money but when you uh just for inflation 1995 uh comes out to be about 93 dollars and 23 cents today jeez so that's like a, a collector's edition <laughs> yeah that's a that's a pricey game for your commodore pet hopefully it came with a uh, felt map <laughs> Don't think it did. Barely came with graphics. The game did, however, receive some positive reviews on release. One reviewer from the magazine The Space Gamer commented that I highly recommend it in spite of the rather high price. That was a full publication called The Space Gamer? <laughs> yes. Did they only review space games? <laughs> that they must have. Like, the 70s were wild. Anyone could have a magazine or a Commodore oh, pet. Oh, man. Like, but it's the 70s, too. So what space games are you arguably <laughs> reviewing that you have a publication for? <laughs> Hopefully it's more than just video games. I, I just looked it up. The Space Gamer was a magazine dedicated to the subject of science fiction and fantasy board games and tabletop games. Oh, board games and tabletop games. Okay. Okay, and they also dabbled with video game reviews. One of their editors was Steve Jackson Games. Yeah, that okay, that makes sense. And that's something that actually happened a lot back in the 70s and 80s because video games and tabletop board games kind of were adjacent to toys, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, they were very much all in the toy category. And these magazines, even we've, we've referenced before many a times like Dungeon or Dragon will have a review for a video game. And that's because the magazines, the public felt that video games were still in scope of their work because they were talking about a game and a game's a yeah. toy so it was a video game so it makes sense that they were prob probably primarily a publication around board games that were space themed and extended themselves to video games because once yeah. again this is the yeah. 70s so it's probably it's probably slim pickings for any uh video games that were space themed in the 70s to also to be fair though a lot of arcade games uh, you put a any type of shoot 'em up is going to be a space game that's true now specifically the space game we're talking about starfleet orion is a space strategy game and possibly one of the first of that genre for microcomputers at the time in the game you have a play field with a grid of various locations and players take turn controlling one or more of their ships and the game ends when one or both players are destroyed or escape from the playfield. In 1979, Automated Simulations made a sequel to Starfleet Orion called Invasion Orion. Uh, the sequel added a computer player so that you did not need to play against another person, which is great if you have no friends. Reviews for the game noted that it was primarily a solo experience, and if you wanted to have live opponents, you should buy Starfleet Orion instead. Basically, Invasion Orion is just the one-player version of Starfleet Orion. <laughs> 
Yeah. That they released as a sequel. Probably for 20 bucks. It sounds like EA in the making. Their next game, Temple of Apshe, was partially what led to the company creating the brand name Epix. As the title would not be a simulation game, Temple of Apshe was a dungeon crawler and is considered one of the first graphical role-playing games for home computers as it predates Acklebeth World of Doom by Richard Garriott, which we talk about in one of our episodes in the past. I think it was when we talked about Ultima. I think in that episode, we may have said that it was one of the first graphical role-playing games, but we may have lied. To be honest, it is one of the first <laughs> graphical role-playing That's games. True. Yeah, we also may have mentioned Temple of Apshe. And also, to be fair, we never said that we were experts. Temple of Apshe was considered a huge success, and it sold 30,000 copies by the end of June 1982, which is a lot, considering the audience is very niche. The success of Temple of Apshe also led to the game spawning the Dungeon Quest series of games. What is really interesting about the Orion games and Temple of Apshe and some other titles uh, that Epic's put out was that they were programmed in BASIC. BASIC, which stands for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code, was really not used much for game development, even during this time period, as it can be incredibly slow. Typically, game developers would create a game in something like assembly language. Uh, assembly language can be easily interpreted into machine code and was often quicker. Programming in BASIC is slow because a computer has to read each individual line and interpret the code before it can actually execute the code. Basic is often good for beginner programs, hence why beginners is in the uh, abbreviation. It's a highly visual language. For example, if you wanted to have a program display and repeat the message, hello world, in most versions of basic, you would simply write 10 print hello world in quotes, 20 go to 10, press enter, press run, and you'll get a nice list of the words hello world repeating on your screen for infinity until you end the program by force stopping it. If you wanted to have hello world be displayed in assembly language, it would take a lot more writing. In fact, I tried to look up Commodore assembly language for putting out hello world. and It was too complicated for me to put down in a vocal medium because it's a lot of like breaking down the segments of what goes into hello world because you're literally telling the code where in memory it needs to target for it to do certain things like display the color of the text, the size of the text, what the background of the text looks like, where the text is positioned on the screen. Literally all those details are included when you're doing something like that. Assembly language is arguably faster than basic when you're doing larger programs. Basic is when you really want to do something simple and basic. That isn't to say basic isn't capable of making games. It's just kind of surprising to make games and sell them, uh, especially action games, which Epix was doing. Uh, they created some action games like Star Warrior, Rescue at Rigel, and Crush, Crumble, and Chomp all out of basic and all using the Temple of Apshi engine. So they basically just took all the code they used for Temple of Apshi and reworked it for these action games. In 1981, John Freeman uh, chose to leave the company after reportedly falling out with Jim Connolly over the latter's desire not to update the game engine they had been using. By 1982, Epix had fallen under hard times, it reached out to various venture capital firms to get some support. This led Michael Katz being put in as manager of the company, and ultimately Jim leaving due to his inability to work with the new management team. Jim would create his own company, the Connolly Group, and take all the programmers at Epix with him. Him, leaving Michael Katz with no programmers to work on games. Let me tell you what people need to make games. Programmers. <laughs> Uh, That's true. <laughs> Mike, Michael looked at another company that the venture firm had some money with, Starpath, who had their own financial difficulties. And Michael was realizing, man, this venture company is really good at buying things that are falling apart. <laughs> and... <laughs> It was also at this time that Epix received a submission to publish a game called Jumpman, designed by Randy Glover. Jumpman was exactly what Epix needed, a smash hit. It sold around 40,000 copies by the end of 1987 and was frequently in the top 10 list for Billboard's top 100 game charts at the time. Jumpman was a puzzle game. Inspired by the game designer Randy Glover stumbling upon the arcade version of Donkey Kong at Pizza Hut. He wanted to bring the game to the home computers. He bought a TI-99, returned it, and then bought an Atari 400 to develop the game. 
That is a detail in the story is that he went to the store. Like after seeing Donkey Kong, he was like, I want this game for home computers. So he went to the store and he saw a TI-99 and an Atari 400. And he said, man, that TI-99 has a great looking keyboard. So he bought it, brought it home, realized he couldn't do diddly on it, and then returned it the next day. Please know if you're not familiar, the TI-99 is a home computer and the Atari 400 also a home computer. This was before home computers just became a bunch of pieces shoved in box. (laughs) That's right. Now, with the success of Jumpman, Epix was able to merge with Starpath and bring over the Starpath programmers and engineers under one company so they could get back to doing work. Epix would also start to discontinue their older games around the same time, as the success of the arcade titles meant that it wasn't cost-effective to program anything like a strategy game, because it takes a long time to make them, and they don't sell really well. I think it was also around this time that Michael Katz uh, left the company. (laughs) I think he was like, I am done with this company. He's like, I I don't know what is going on and how this company is still around. Now, sometime in 1986, designers at Epix had begun work on a handheld game system called the Handy Game. (laughs) That's such a bad name. I know. <laughs> so at least it's unique, right? We live in a world where you could buy, I think Zach and I both own consoles that are just two letters and three numbers. And that is the console name, uh, the RGB351. But Handy Game for a handheld? They plan to show off the Handy Game at the Winter CES in January of 1989. <laughs> Epix, however, was not in the best place financially when they were coming up with this game system. They clearly didn't have any marketing people on staff. A few years prior, they were in a lawsuit with Data East, who sued them for copyright infringement, with the game World Karate Championship being, according to Data East, too similar to their game Karate Champ. Epix would actually lose the suit with an order made for them to recall their game. However, they appealed, and the judge found in favor of Epix in the appeal, as Data East didn't own the idea of a karate game, according to the judge. So, so in a court of law... Yes, their game is very similar, but no, Data East, you do not own karate games. <laughs> However, going through a lawsuit is not great for you if you're a company, nor cheap. Even if you uh, eventually do win an appeal, there's still a whole bunch of costs that you end up losing. After this, Epix faced another financial hit, which was the fact that they had been so reliant on the Commodore 64 market. When the 64 market began to become obsolete, they were facing a massive dip in sales. If you think about it when they were around putting out their games in basic and on the commodore 64 and before that the pet they were in a great place because everyone out there was buying games for the commodore 64 but in the late 1980s the ibm pc was around and pc compatibles and people were switching over to ms dos so why would you be making games for a game system that was arguably no longer relevant to people Epix was on the brink of bankruptcy and was also uninterested in expanding into the console market, which probably could have saved them, but was due to the fact that Nintendo's licensing policy was too strict for their interests. Atari was actually brought on to assist Epix with the creation of their handy game, which they decided was a good choice to rename as the Lynx. I, I imagine this is day one Atari coming in to uh, meet with Epix. <laughs> they walk in, Atari's like, Epix, could you tell us wait, what's your what's your next handheld? And Epix is like, we call it the handy game. And Atari's like, that's garbage. <laughs> and like, somebody's just like looking out and it's just like we're calling it links like there's a picture of a cat links on the wall <laughs> the atari person is just like mm, links now this seemed like a good idea for atari to team up with this company that was on the brink of bankruptcy to create a game system that they had a bad name for epics ultimately would not be a good choice for atari to team up with as they failed to make various production deadlines which led to atari refusing to pay epics this led to epics filing for chapter 11 bankruptcy and atari taking on the majority of the work for the system now during this bankruptcy epics went from a company of like 150 employees to eight employees by the end of 1993 that is how badly they were hit just really like that first of all it was going to be epix's handy game and (laughs) then atari came in to help and then all of a sudden atari was doing all of the work and it became the atari wings atari's like you guys are so bad at doing this and then they're like i guess we're doing it and now atari is like i guess we're releasing a handheld what's funny is it's reported that because epix were using amigas to develop for the handy game slash the links atari when they took on the majority of the work had to 
acquire Amiga computers, and they had to acquire these computers from their competitor, Commodore, in order to actually program for their own system. Whoever was in charge at Atari over this project was probably so incredibly frustrated. Like, I can just imagine them sitting in their office and somebody that works for them coming in and going, hey, just so you know, like, now that we're taking over this whole new Atari Lynx type of situation, be like, yeah, 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 uh, we got a program for it. Okay, sure. Can only program for it on, uh, on Amigas. What? Yeah, sorry. We have to only program on Amigas. Why? Well, it's just how it's built. <laughs> so instead of being able to program on our own Atari STs, which we have plenty of because we own them, we have to go to our competitor and ask them for computers. Yes, sir. Go to the store that's not Commodore <laughs> and, buy, <laughs> and buy Amigas from somebody else. Now, to bring us all back to why we're even talking about Epic's Chips Challenge, right? Before Epic's would file for bankruptcy, Chuck Somerville, a programmer at the company, led a project to develop a game during the 10-week idle period in the development of the Lynx. Chuck would develop a prototype for a game on the Apple II and show it off to the heads at Epic's, who I imagine were like one dude at this point. The game would become what we know as Chip's Challenge. Chuck would go on to design a third of the levels, with the rest being developed by other staff. Chip yeah. is also a, like a shorthand for Chuck. Chip's Challenge is a fairly simple game, as it's a version of Sokoban. Uh, as I talked about in the last episode, Sokoban is a puzzle game where you push blocks to get to your objective. Sokoban is a very successful a puzzle game in Japan. As I mentioned, there's lots of Sokobans. Sokoban 1, Sokoban 2, Sokoban 3. Uh, it goes on forever. And in Chip's Challenge, uh, you'll be kind of pushing blocks around, but instead of putting crates into slots and warehouses, you are going to be looking for computer chips. You play as Chip McCallahan, uh, a nerd who is challenged to go through Melinda the Mental Marvels Clubhouse to prove himself and gain entrance into the Bit Busters Club. This involves pushing blocks out of the way, avoiding monsters, avoiding fireballs, using special boots to traverse ice, fire, water, and rocking out to some catchy music. The clubhouse that you must traverse consists of 144 levels with four secret levels, bringing the total for the levels for the first game to 148, which is pretty significant. It's a, a lot of levels. I remember even when I was playing it as a child, I always was like, wow, there's a lot of levels. And I was always impressed that they were they weren't just like dumb, like all the other levels weren't dumb. They were all pretty difficult. Now, after its release on the Atari Lynx, the game would get ported to the Atari ST, the Amiga, Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, and the Amstrad CPC. There is also a port to MS-DOS, which is closer to the original Lynx version and nothing like the version that would eventually end up on Microsoft Windows. Microsoft would license the game from Epix for Windows 3.1, and the Microsoft version would be reworked under the directions of Tony Garcia, who served as the director of Lucasfilm Games and the founder of Microsoft Game Studios. The Windows 3.1 version was coded by Tony Kruger, and artwork was created by Ed Halley. Reportedly, the Windows version was programmed in a single summer. Now, the Windows version features some significant changes. Objects do not move smoothly, there are no splash flashes or explosions, and various other aesthetic changes were made to things like Chip's tools. In the Lynx version, you collect a water shield. In the Windows version, flippers. In the Lynx version, you collect a magnet. In the Windows version, suction boots. The Lynx version, you collect fire shields. In the Windows version, you collect fire boots. And in the Lynx version, you put on cleats to walk on ice. But in the Windows version, you put on ice skates. Now, the Chip's Challenge wiki, which is called like the Bitbusters Club, uh, does note that this last change really doesn't make sense because ice skates would not make you walk easier on the ice. They would in fact make you slip faster. In the Windows version, there is an extra level with the total number of levels being 149. This extra level is exclusive to the Windows version. Another difference is the Lynx version has a total of 13 music tracks, while the Windows version has two, with a third being added in if your computer has a copy of canyon.mid in its computer files. So if you happen to have canyon.mid, uh, which I'll put a little bit here.
love hearing canyon.mid. If you happen to have that, then uh, you would be graced with having three music tracks for your 149 levels as opposed to just two. Microsoft would include the game in their fourth release of the Microsoft Entertainment Pack, and it was included in the best of Microsoft Entertainment Pack. The Windows version also has some secret passwords that bring up a variety of Easter eggs. One password, M-A-N-D, brings up a Mandelbrot generator, which is always interesting to see. Mandelbrot generators, they they generate Mandelbrot splotches, which are these like never-ending uh, shapes that keep like churning out pieces of the same shape over and over again. It's hard to describe. If you Google Mandelbrot generator, you'll see what they look like. Another password, Tony, brings up a level that features tiles that spell out the developer's names. In regards to how well did Chip's challenge sell, well, it sold well enough to become essentially default with Windows 3.1 versions. <laughs> the reviews of the game were incredibly positive. One review for the Atari Lynx version of the game stated, If there's one game that will sell Lynx's, Chip's Challenge is it. Uh, the Amiga version of the game received an 88% from the One Magazine, and the gameplay was praised as a puzzle player's dream. Another review from Computer Gaming World stated that the game had a, a set of addicting puzzle software levels and was a fix for testing the acceleration speed of one's brain. Now, in terms of the legacy, the Chips Challenge wiki notes that Chips Challenge as a whole has a rather interesting legacy, as the version that is arguably considered to be the most nostalgic is not the original version of the game. People tend to remember the Microsoft version, and in fact, I was on some YouTube videos, and a majority of people did not even know there was a Lynx version, or that, like, the DOS version existed. People know of the Microsoft version, to the point that Chips Challenge 2, which was created by Chuck Somerville, takes its aesthetic from the Windows version, and um, there's even a mode you can do to swap the graphics so they're identical to the Windows version. The sequel, Chips Challenge 2, was created by Chuck Somerville back in 1999, but he was not able to release the game due to a trademark dispute. When Epix went bankrupt, their assets were acquired by Bridgestone Multimedia Group, a Christian publishing company who wanted Epix assets because Epix put out Bible software at one point and Bridgestone said hey wouldn't it be great if we could put out Bible software because we're a Bible company and they just acquired a whole bunch of Epic's assets so Chuck went to Bridgestone and said hey I really want to make Chips Challenge 2 can I have uh, the, the rights to that and Bridgestone said sure pay us over $100,000 and we will give you the rights to the game <laughs> and Chuck said no <laughs> so from that point on <laughs> no one had Chips Challenge except for Bridgestone in 2010 Chuck was able to start working out negotiations with Bridgestone, and eventually the game was released via Steam in 2015. So even though he started negotiations in 2010, it was about a five-year process for those negotiations to fully go through. Chips Challenge 2 was released in 2015, along with the original Chips Challenge. Chuck would also create uh, a game during the interim before he had approval over releasing Chips Challenge. This was Chuck's Challenge, a puzzle game that follows a similar structure. In 2014, he also released Chuck's Challenge 3. 3D, which was funded through Kickstarter and released on Steam. It was also a launch title for the NVIDIA Shield. Outside of the games made by Chuck Somerville, there is a lively Chips Challenge fan community who've created various level packs. These level packs were developed for Tile World, an open source version of the game that was created during this time period between 1999 and 2015 when people couldn't play Chips Challenge legally, really. So Tile World is an open source game that you could actually just upload Chips Challenge assets into Tile World world so that you could just play chips challenge in tile world so that was just a way that people were able to play the game for a while um and they were tons of level packs that were released for it most recently as of like i think around 2021 maybe 2020 a snes and genesis version were created for chips challenge and released as physical cartridges and they're apparently pretty good but i heard the music's bad in the genesis version chips challenge just releases whenever it wants <laughs> that's right uh and that's the long story story of Chip's Challenge. Uh, we'll actually probably revisit the Atari Lynx as a whole someday because we only kind of scratch the surface on the history of the Lynx, but we'll, we can revisit it if people are interested. I know we still like to cover consoles, so maybe someday we'll come back to that. But that is our Epic slash Lynx slash Chip's Challenge episode. Now let's get into our retro rewind. Seth had me play Wargame Construction Set 3, Age of Rifles, 1846 to 1905. <laughs> that name just 
just rolls off your tongue. It sure does. It was developed by Strategic Simulations in 1996. The game truly lives up to the simulations part of Strategic Simulations name. You play various battles through the time period of 1846 through 1905, which include the American Civil War, the Crimean War, the Anglo-Zulu War, the Afghan War, and so on and so on. Basically, you choose your side and your opponent plays as the other side. <laughs> Half of those locations, we've had war again in them. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. After taking your turns in the game, uh, the combat occurs and you either lose or win after a lot of back and forth. It's a turn-based strategy game. So you basically decide where your characters move, you move them, you decide who they're attacking, you let the other player take their turn and you go back and forth and it's kind of about arranging your troops in a way so that you can get a better hold over the enemy while also making sure that you don't lose it's a fairly straightforward game uh in terms of movement you pretty much just click on your character that you want to move you drag them they'll move that way and for combat you click on your character and you can sometimes target the enemy depending on how many moves you have left i was confused by the fact that you could if you choose to spontaneously change sides just if you really wanted to so in the middle of the game, I accidentally swapped sides from the Union to the Confederates. And I was like, whoa, I don't want to be these guys. So I had to swap back. You could play as one side, put them into a horrible position, then go on to the other side and win. Basically, yes. The game is uh, interesting. It's heavily stats based with a lot of data being provided for each set of units. Uh, overall, I thought it was neat, but not my type of game. Does it hold up? Maybe if you like strategy games. The, the artwork for the game reminded me very much, like the cover, reminded me very much much of age of empires but age of empires came out the next year so unless uh unless i was looking at a like box art from a later release of age of rifles i don't know but they do put age of rifles on the box art at least in exodos very prominently <laughs> And like underneath it says 1846-1905. And at the very top it says Wargame Construction Set 3. Yeah, because there's other Wargame Construction Sets. So I think this is actually going back to what SSI did with the Gold Box games. Where they kind of like theme their game collections in a, in one collection, right? So they're like, we're going to do Wargame Construction Sets. And we're going to call those like Wargame Boxes. This one in particular is Age of Rifles. And so people are aware of when the Age of Rifles rifles is because if you ask somebody on the street when was the age of rifles they probably won't know what you're saying or give you an accurate time so then they put 1846 to 1905 you know I'm going to try it. Tomorrow, when I go to the office, I'm going to find someone on the street and go, excuse me, sir, when was the age of rifles? As long as you hold up a uh, a little mic and a camera, you can get away with it because you could just pretend that you're on TikTok. That's true. Next week, Seth, you can play Commander Keen for MS-DOS. Okie dokie. Uh, Zach had me play Batman Return of the Joker, or if you read the title top to the bottom on the box, it's Return of the Joker, Batman. The game is an action platformer developed by Sunsoft and published by Sunsoft and released for the NES. There was also a release for the Game Boy and a remake for the Sega Genesis. Uh, the NES version was released in 1991. The Game Boy and Sega Genesis games were released the next year. The Genesis version was titled Batman Revenge of the Joker. However, I didn't play that game, so I, I, I can't tell you the differences. However, uh, the Game Boy version is not an action platformer, but it's just a platformer because Batman doesn't shoot. He just platforms. Now, I played the NES version where you play as Batman, who in this game is blue and has a wrist gun where sometimes the power-up that you get for the wrist gun is fun and sometimes the power-up is bad. You start off with like shooting like these like chromatic batarangs out of your wrist cannon and then the first pick up you shoot you shoot two chromatic batarangs but instead of being shot in a straight line or a straight line and a a different line they are shot in arching shots that go what is it when it's like goes up like a curve they're like cur yeah they're like reversed curve shots the enemies being primarily in front of you and these bullets tend to go over them so that's annoying but the next upgrade after that you just blast like it's like a shotgun blast it does have some really fun music that while playing with it which i enjoy i feel like older games always need a really good soundtrack or else it kind of takes away from the experience i am not great at older games specifically action platformers for the nes and uh, i died in one spot the first time and then the second time i was uh, the second my second life i was playing i died 
uh, in a spot slightly farther away. Thought I was doing better. Was not, apparently. I don't hate myself after playing it, so it rates better than the other games that Zach has given me over time. There are, I think, in my opinion, better action plat- Batman action platformers out there. Uh, however, it's not a bad... I, I, I think it holds up. Like, with the understanding it's for an NES, so, like, there's limitations of the hardware, but the sprites are big, it's tough, like an NES game, and uh, you can blast people. It's kind of like if Batman and Mega Man had a had a child and it came out deformed. Now, next week, Zach, you could play Earthworm Jim 3D for the N64. Great, I can't wait. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone enjoyed today's episode. If you have any memories of Chip's Challenge, be sure to email us at classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com. We're available wherever podcasts can be found, such as iHeartRadio or iTunes or Podbean. And we're also available on Facebook at Classic Gaming Brothers, Instagram at Classic Gaming Brothers, X at CG Brothers Pod, or Blue Sky at CG Brothers Pod. Thank you everyone for listening. I think that's everything. Seth, did I forget anything? Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Seth. And I've been Zach. And we've been the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's... That's right. Yes, that is right.